Hello and welcome to the Modern Digital Enterprise, the digital transformation podcast from Annexinet. Today we'll be talking about how Annexinet is maintaining, if not improving, the quality of our services by virtualizing our strategy process in the face of the new normal. Annexinet General Manager and Executive VP Al Sporer will be our guest host. So without further ado, take it away, Al. Welcome to the NextNet Microcast today. We are going to be talking about virtual strategy sessions and especially in the new normal of everybody working from home and not being able to be in person when you're driving your strategy out. We're going to be talking with James Hosher, our senior strategist who helps drive our client's strategy forward and, and how we are actually helping our clients today. So my name is Al Spore. I'm the general manager of our digital business at NextNet. And James, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. James Hoshor, uh, Senior Digital Strategist with Annexinet. I've been in the technology field for over 30 years and specifically the last 10 plus years working with our clients in their digital transformation initiatives. Looking forward to sharing our thoughts and insights on this call with you. Great. Thanks, James. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Let's just jump into the topic. So in this new normal world where people can't get together and, and where we would typically use our kickstart methodology to drive a client's strategy forward, especially around digital applications and engagement. Can, can you tell us what we're seeing in the markets right now and some of the things that we're seeing from our clients when it comes to leaning into uh, driving their digital strategies and not waiting? Yeah, sure, Al. So definitely with the, the pandemic that we're all facing now and have been for the last couple of months, would, one of the things uh, that we're really seeing clients uh, focus on is preparing their employees to cope with this new change in, in how we are working in a virtual environment today. And a lot of that's being driven around uh, culture mindset uh, shifts, you know, from embracing and adapting the, the you know, digital native uh, approaches, you know, leveraging Zoom and, and Microsoft Teams and Skype and all those types of technologies to be able to, to continue to meet and collaborate on. We're also seeing that clients are trying to figure out how do we control this disruption? Every client's face disruption over the years of, of their existence, but this has certainly been accelerated out there in both from a business and technology disruption, uh, and we don't see that stopping. This will continue to be the, the norm here, at least for the next six to 12 months. And so a lot of our clients are kind of restructuring themselves or putting in what they call transformational management offices. So folks that are dedicated to accelerate uh, a lot of the initiatives that they were focused on maybe later in the roadmap to help mitigate some of the, the issues and challenges with you know, uh, a virtual workforce and, and interacting not only with their employees, but even customers and partners in this new virtual world. So we're, we're seeing that IT and business are really starting to become more you know, consolidated in becoming partners with one another instead of IT and being just a, a service provider in everyday's organization. They're becoming true partner and they're really focused on trying to drive value to the organization and making sure that they are aligned. And I think IT's also taking a step back and looking at their strategic roadmaps and figuring out what do we now have to move to the front of our uh, strategic initiatives because we weren't you know, necessarily prepared for some of these challenges that we're facing. So we're seeing a lot of focus around cybersecurity and making sure that since we're all now interfacing digitally and, and virtually, that security's become even a bigger focus for organizations. We're, we're seeing that applications are, are now being looked at to being refreshed and platforms are being more modernized to support this digital world. So those are some of the key things that we've been seeing out there definitely in the last three, four months. That's great, Jim. So just as we were you know, coming through February and, and early you know, pre-COVID, as we saw it starting to build, we had the ability to engage with a number of our clients to help drive their strategy, especially when it came to customer engagement applications and, and maybe some new business lines that they wanted to code digitally and you know, really lean on our offerings around kickstarts and the methodology that we would go through through ideation and value creation and road mapping. And those were always done in person. And clearly as the month of March came along and we were unable to go out and do those in person, we were still able to execute some of those strategic offerings with them. And 
do you want to tell me a little bit about you know maybe some of the objections that we had from the, our clients on how we would do that and then maybe how we overcame them and and then we'll kind of dig into some of the opportunities that we see going forward around doing you know virtual strategy and leaning into the current environment that we see today sure Al. so i think probably the biggest concern that most organizations had was around securing the conversation that would be had in this virtual environment and so everybody's pretty much aware of zoom being exposed and some uninvited visitors you know popping in on folks's web conferences and things like that so i think that was one of the concerns we had to overcome and address is how would we be able to facilitate virtual collaborative sessions with folks spread across the U.S. And, and even globally and mitigate any risk of uninvited visitors and stuff. So making sure that we had platforms that were able to support security, so password to be able to, to get into the particular web conference and in uh, video there uh, was one way we addressed that. So by leveraging like Microsoft Teams, for example, we're seeing a lot of publicity around Microsoft Teams and how they're helping the organizations address this COVID-19 pandemic here. And by incorporating the right security measures and controls in there, we were able to overcome those concerns with our clients from, from that perspective. I think the other one was making sure that the employees were set up to be able to successfully participate in a, a video and audio conference meeting, you know, making sure that they had proper internet coverage in their home, that they were also addressing any distractions that may come up because we've all had those conference calls. I'm sure people that are listening to this will get a chuckle, but I had a call yesterday with a client of ours and his three-year-old granddaughter popped up in the Zoom meeting with us and was delivering her grandfather a package that he just got. And we've had pets come into the mix where the cats come across. But, you know, I think people were kind of concerned at first about how do we address those distractions as they come up. But at the end of the day, everybody gets a chuckle out of it. And I think everybody recognizes that, you know, this is not the norm, but we've got to overcome and adapt to it and just move on. So it kind of helps lighten the mood up. But I do see, and to your point, Al, the most recent client engagement that we had, the positives that we received, the positive feedback is that this particular client said that we probably would have never gotten the C-level executives all the way down to some of the key stakeholders to participate in these sessions if we were doing in person, just because of the busy schedules and, and conflicts and stuff. But by them working from their homes virtually, they're, they're not commuting you know, to the office. They're not going from one conference room on this side of the building to another conference room on the other side of the building and, and having this inefficiencies of time management. Everybody's sitting at their kitchen table or maybe they've got a home office and and they're easily able to join a meeting quickly just by accepting that uh, meeting invite and leveraging Teams or Zoom or other some other web audio tools. So, and in fact, I just had a call with the CEO of a, of a large healthcare organization. He said the exact same thing that they've seen an increase in productivity and efficiencies because they're not having you know some of those normal challenges with getting to meetings inside of the office or outside of the office even. So, this is uh, be able to improve some of that participation and also be able to get uh, a bigger, wide range of folks to, to participate as well. So for us, this last client that we worked with, we were able to get 27 people that range from the sea level all the way down to technology professionals to participate and spread across the U.S. and be very successful in leveraging different ideation tools out there, like Miro, for example, that we could uh, still facilitate the ideation process that we use at an Exonet just as if we were going to do that in person. So we were able to create a virtual ideation board and, and have people present their ideas and place them on the board in the corresponding uh, points that aligned with their, their target users and their business drivers, for example, when we were trying to ideate around a new product idea for the company. So the client was very pleased with how people were able to participate virtually and they could still visually see the results of that live on the screen and have that true interaction just as if we were sitting in their conference room. Great, James.
Let me dig into that on a couple points. One, the process that we go through, our methodology is very interactive. So, you know, a lot of that interaction is done face to face. As you said, it's very visual. You know, we, you know, in a typical process would use stickies and other tools. And then when we get to the POC or the clickable demo that we create again, another highly interactive and typically, you know, high participation effort. So two things that I just wanted to hit. One, how was it to facilitate a large virtual group? Because even in a normal scenario, that's a large group to facilitate both in person and, and virtually. And how, you know, how do you, you know, my first question is, how, how did you facilitate that? And the second one is, how were the tools and how do you think that both you running it you know, from the lens of, of an employee and the rest of the team from NextNet running it, viewed the tools and the process? And how do you think the client viewed it? So you know, again, you know, how, was, how did you manage participation? And then, you know, how did you think that the tools themselves lend them to create both that interactive and visual pieces of the work that we do? Sure. So two really good questions there. So we'll start out with the facilitation. For me, I'm used to facilitating meetings, whether it's, you know, physically in person or even virtually via tools like Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams and stuff out there. So for me, it wasn't so much of a challenge for our customers for the participants they had on their side, I think it was challenging for some because they hadn't uh, been involved with with using these types of tools and technologies to have meetings, uh, especially ones where we're sharing a screen and using tools to do ideation or to evaluate existing applications and so forth. So what we did to help ease that adoption of, of these tools and stuff is we actually hosted a, a, a quick 15 minute introduction to these tools and to the frameworks and the processes that we were going to use through these facilitated sessions. So we took some time up front to make sure that all the participants uh, were comfortable with the tools. They knew how to use the chat feature in the tool to be able to uh, raise a question without interrupting the facilitator. We would make sure that we took the time to pause after certain statements or discussions and allow people to ask questions or buy some additional comments and stuff. So you just have to be a little bit more conscientious about you can't physically see somebody. And so taking, you know, extra steps just to to pause every now and then to make sure that people have the time to raise a hand or to address things that are raised in the chat. So from a facilitation, it's just a matter of making sure people are educated and how to use these tools and, and how we're going to, you know, interact through this. So setting the proper guidelines up front was key. And so we actually sent a list of kind of rules and guidelines, if you will, or, or best practices to all of our clients, participants ahead of time. So they could read through that and see, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to do it. And then again, we reviewed that right at the beginning of, of the, the session there and walk through the tool itself. So once we got past that first meeting in educational and introduction to these tools, it went very smooth and seamless. And in fact, everybody was really geeking out, if you will, about how we could do the different things we could with the technologies out there. The, the tools themselves, you know, we were used to using a lot of the web conferencing tools uh, that I've mentioned already. And so where our education came in is bringing in the different tools to facilitate virtual ideation boards or virtual whiteboards and be able to facilitate experiences that we normally would do physically in person at a client site. And so for us to be able to quickly ramp up on how to use those tools and make sure that they're going to drive the desired outcomes for us and our clients, we were able to quickly do that with the, the tools today's and most of the tools that we found out there have evolved quite, quite a bit. And so in fact, we found out that some of the tools that we end up using were already being used by our clients. So that was even a a better win-win for us because there, there wasn't a, an education that we had to do with all of our clients, but with the ones that we did, we were able to educate them quickly as well through our own education that we went through. That's great. Thanks. And having had the opportunity to support you on some of these kickstarts, I know one never breaks the rules that James Hosher puts together. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'm sure our clients followed the rules to a T because the consequences I'm sure were swift and mighty. So let me ask this, how did it feel? I, I think you've probably done you know, 40, 50 kickstarts, strategy sessions, you know, over, over the last 
three or four years. How did it feel doing it virtually? Did it feel like a normal Kickstarter? Or did it feel a little different to you? Oh, it certainly felt different because I love the in-person interaction, working with clients and, and my peers. And so that, that definitely, you know, you don't have that in-person dynamic there, but I actually have a, a desk at home that, it, that raises up and down. So I actually found myself standing up as if I was standing up in that client boardroom to give me at least that sense of feeling that I'm standing up in front of a, a, a group of colleagues as, as well as client participants to get my mindset in that, hey, I'm running my Kickstarter just like I would if I was sitting on site the client. And so I changed the way I was doing things here at home and in, in my home office to kind of replicate how I would be delivering it if I was in front of a, a real audience at the client site. So you know, so it's just mind shift, right? And, you know, getting dressed in, in like a business tire, and I'm not talking about full suit and, and tie and everything, but, you know, putting a collared shirt on like a polo shirt and just making sure that, you know, you're putting yourself in that mindset of that you're at the client because we actually enjoyed putting the video on for everybody. So everybody got to see who you are, you know, physically, as well as hearing you obviously through the audio aspect of the platforms we were using. But I think everybody enjoyed seeing, uh, you know, where everybody's at. Some people used the virtual backgrounds, which was funny. You know, they put a beach up there or they put a, a, you know, another conference room or something, you know, but most people just enjoyed the fact that they could show where they're at in, in their home office. And a lot of people were at kitchen tables. A lot of people went down to their basements or their recreational rooms and stuff like that. So I think we all got a chuckle out of that. For me, that was probably the only thing is, is, changing your mindset uh, and trying to still replicate how you would be delivering if you were in person. Great. All right. Two more questions. First one is how did the client perceive the deliverables and were they of the quality that we, when we do them on site, you know, did they perceive them the same way? And how, how do you think the executive readout and next steps went compared to an on site one? Uh, well, certainly the quality of deliverables were just as good, if not better than what we would would deliver it anyway in our kickstart process. And I say they, they might be a little bit better because we were able to spend uh, even more time reviewing them with a client again, because we're not having to commute to a client site or back and forth from their office to the hotel and things like that. It was easier to get people to participate on these web conferences and to schedule impromptu meetings as needed to make sure that we had the clarity needed to provide the right recommendations and so forth. So I think this, you know, definitely lent itself to, to making sure that we even had a higher quality than what we normally would deliver. And, and that was well perceived by the clients themselves. And, and I think the clients enjoyed the framework in which we use and how we facilitate and the, the way we involve the clients in, in all levels of stakeholders. They really saw a lot of value in that. And, and, and they appreciated that we were able to facilitate it to drive synergies and a shared vision across IT and the business folks. That was definitely well received by them. All right. So in the second question, and we'll, we'll end it on this. I think we all agree we're probably several months, if not quarters away from everybody hopping on planes and going out to clients. But do you, do you see this as a valuable tool going forward and in, in doing at least some level of virtual engagement with our clients? You know, clearly we have, I think, two or three coming up here in the next couple of weeks that we'll, we'll be doing the strategy. But you know, going forward, do you think this is a valuable tool that we'll continue to use this you know, process approach of using some level of virtual going forward? Absolutely, I do. Uh, and I think that was validated through discussions I had this week with both existing clients as well as prospective clients that we were talking to about how we can come in and still help them deliver these types of engagements virtually. And these clients that I've spoken to, like even the one I referenced this morning, they've already seen how this has made them become more efficient and effective because of be able to quickly jump on a, on a Zoom call or, or a Teams meeting and be able to uh, be more focused and they're, they're not being distracted by hanging around the water cooler or, you know, commutes or, or the craziness that, you know, sometimes office environments can provide there. We've certainly seen it being more effective. I think also clients are going to be more willing to adapt this because of eliminating travel costs. 
That mm-hmm. was another comment I had a client I was sp- speaking to yesterday. You know, they're seeing that significant savings in doing their customer engagements virtually now and not having to put people on a plane for a one hour meeting that may cost them three, four thousand dollars, you know, for travel costs from airfare to hotels to car rentals to eating out and Ubers and et cetera, right? So I think clients are are seeing that they can be successful doing this. And that this uh, is going to be, I think, personally, I think it's going to be ad- ad- adopted into the way customers will go forward and organizations will go forward to, to transact their business. It may not be 100% because I still think everybody believes there's, there's a strong value to be gained by doing in-person meetings. But I think we're also going to see that this will become certainly more part of a, a process, at least at the initial part of engagements whether it's across the organization or externally with partners or customers and so forth. Yeah, that's great stuff. Yeah. And I think what we've seen, because, and I'll just go back to the first question, participation by our clients in these, you know, in our strategy sessions, the level of engagement is a lot. Yeah. You know, we expect a lot of our clients, but they're not always in one spot too. So I think the ability to get more t- participants, like you said, involved in these things at a lower cost is going to continue to be a, a major theme that we'll see going forward here, even when we do start traveling. So, well, James, I, I really appreciate the time this afternoon. Thank you. It was great to talk to you. Always good to catch up with you. And I look forward to the next time that we get to have a chat on this topic. And for the audience out there, you guys all have a great afternoon and hope you enjoy the content. Thank you, everybody, and have a great afternoon. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Modern Digital Enterprise. The Digital Transformation Podcast from Annexinet, part of the Annexinet Podcast Network. Be safe, be healthy. Bye-bye. As a leading technology consultancy and reseller, Annexinet helps clients provide a complete digital experience for customers, employees, and end users. We accomplish this through our holistic approach, which encompasses all aspects of today's digital journey end-to-end. Annexinet partners with top technology vendors like HPE to offer products and services that enhance the digital experience across customer engagement, enterprise mobility, cloud and hybrid IT, and analytics. Because great digital experiences rely on the smooth operation of all interconnected elements. From strategy through execution, we deliver custom multi-channel applications, including web, mobile, chat, and voice with self-service apps for customer loyalty and enterprise apps that streamline internal processes. Now, you can reimagine legacy applications to propel your business forward. Annexinet also helps you embrace modern cloud and hybrid IT infrastructure to provide a seamless experience at every touchpoint, empowering you to recover quickly from disaster, scale to meet demand, and automate systems for perfect performance 24-7. And to maximize your competitive advantage, we ensure you always deliver the best experience possible by continuously honing your digital solutions through data-driven insights. So, how do you know if your business has what it takes to provide the complete digital experience? One that sets you apart, maintains competitive edge, and turns users into passionate fans? Simple. Just give us a call. Together, we can deepen engagement and make every digital experience remarkable.